In 1677, a confession of faith was produced by many Baptist churches in England. It was based on previous confessions like the 1644 Baptist Confession, the Savoy Declaration of the Congregationalists, and the Westminster Confession of the Presbyterians. However, this confession wasn't released to much fanfare. There was still persecution and suppression of nonconformists in England at the time, so the churches were quiet in their use of the statement of faith. In 1689, things changed. The Toleration Act was passed by the English Parliament and received royal assent in May, providing limited religious freedom, particularly to Protestants, but not to Catholics, Unitarians, or atheists, among others. Baptists were now free to express their views, and in July of the same year, representatives from over 100 particular Baptist congregations came together to officially and publicly endorse the 1677 Confession. However, they added a preface and dated it to the current year of 1689, the name it has retained today. The 1689 Confession is the most subscribed to confession of Reformed Baptists today, and in this video we'll be looking at the doctrine and practice of the churches that hold to it, today primarily known by the moniker of Reformed Baptist. There are Reformed Baptists who don't utilize this confession, but that's not who I'll be referring to in this video. In this video I'll refer to the 1689 Baptist Confession whenever it speaks on a topic and I'll just call it the Confession. However, I will quote churches in this video that do have some varying level of how strictly they hold to the confession. For example, Hope Baptist Church in Wake Forest, North Carolina says, We hold to the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. All officers must uphold and teach these standards. Members are free to take exception to anything not contrary to the five points of orthodoxy listed in the Essential Doctrines page, provided they do not promote dissension regarding the items listed in the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689 or in the principles communicated in the Constitution of Hope Baptist Church. Edgewood Baptist Church in Anderson, Indiana says, We have adopted the 1689 Confession of Faith as a statement of the teachings we hold Scripture to clearly teach. These doctrines are carefully taught and applied. The Word of God is always our ultimate authority, but we find it beneficial to hold to this confession to prevent our church from being blown to and fro doctrinally. Reformed Baptist Church of Northern Colorado says, We hold this confession substantially, meaning that we hold to the doctrines expressed in each chapter, yet with liberty and charity over minor matters of wording and application and nuance not essential to those doctrines as a whole. Legacy Reformed Baptist Church in East Grand Forks, Minnesota has a reading from the confession during their worship service as well as a catechism question. Reformed Baptist churches often prominently emphasize the five solas of the Reformation. Reforming Truth Church says, We are Protestant and confessional. We are Protestant and are grateful for the work of the Reformers and their contention for the Christian faith and for their work in restoring a gospel-centered approach to the church. We affirm the five solas of the Protestant Reformation for their usefulness as a framework for understanding the gospel. The website of Reformed Baptist Church of Elizabethtown says, For those who say that particular Baptists were not, at least to some degree, impacted by the great strides made in and during the Reformation, and that Baptists have always existed from the Church's foundation by our Lord and Savior, must ignore historical facts. This is not to say that many churches outside Roman Catholicism were not Baptistic in their confessions, polity, and soteriology, but the fact is that the earliest particular Baptist Church was not constituted until the first half of the 17th century. Also, shortly after particular Baptists began to establish churches, they produced their first confession of faith in 1644. Since that time, biblical and particular Baptist churches have been confessional. In the confession, the doctrine of the Trinity is affirmed and that Christ took a human nature but without sin, that he was born of a virgin and is the mediator between God and man. He perfectly fulfilled the law, was crucified, died, and arose after three days, later ascended to heaven where he intercedes, and will one day return to judge all at the end of the world. Souls never die or sleep, but after the body dies, go to paradise or to hell. Reformed Baptists observe two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some Reformed Baptists use the term sacrament. The candidate for baptism is only believers and not infants, and the mode is only by immersion. Many Reformed Baptist churches have weekly communion, with monthly also being not uncommon, and a minority observe less often. Some congregations use wine in the cup, while others use grape juice. The Confession says that there is no real sacrifice made for remission of sins in the ordinance, but a memorial of Christ's offering up of himself on the cross. The elements remain in substance and nature, only bread and wine. Based on that, you may assume Reformed Baptists hold to a symbolic view of communion, and in fact, many do, such as Christ the King Church in Utica, New York. However, the Confession also says, Worthy receivers, outwardly partaking of the visible elements in this ordinance, 
Do then also inwardly by faith, really and indeed, yet not carnally and corporally, but spiritually receive and feed upon Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death, the body and blood of Christ being then not corporally or carnally, but spiritually present to the faith of believers in that ordinance, as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. This, with a few minor changes, is functionally identical to the same passage in the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Presbyterian Confession, which view is often called spiritual presence. Another passage of the Confession says, The grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts, and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also, and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer, and other means appointed of God, it is increased and strengthened. Richard C. Barcelos, pastor of Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Lancaster, California, wrote the book, The Lord's Supper as a Means of Grace, More Than a Memory, promoting a view beyond the memorial position. Providence Reformed Baptist Church in Irvine, California says, We believe that the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. By the Holy Spirit and through faith, believers' spirits are nourished on Christ and all his benefits. Redeemer Reformed Baptist Church in Redlands, California says, Through the Lord's Supper, we not only recall the sacrifice of Christ for us, but we are also confirmed and nourished in all the benefits of his death. There can be some variety among Reformed Baptists on who is allowed to receive communion. Disciple Church in Whittier, California encourages all baptized Christ followers to take in communion each week. Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Dalton, Georgia requires communicants to have a public profession, be baptized, be repentant, and seek to obey God and be a member in good standing in a church that affirms the gospel. Trinity Baptist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana says, We fence the table, offering it only to the members of Trinity Baptist Church. We also invite others after we've had an opportunity to meet them and hear their testimony. If it is your first visit, we recommend that you refrain from partaking of the Lord's Supper until you've had an opportunity to speak with the pastor. The first chapter of the Confession lists the canon of Scripture at 66 books and says that they are given by the inspiration of God. It also says the books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon or rule of the Scripture and therefore are of no authority to the Church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. Of the Bible's authority, the Confession says, The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience and the authority of the Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed, depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. Therefore, it is to be received because it is the word of God. Additionally, it is said, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the Spirit or traditions of men. Today, Reformed Baptists also use the term of inerrancy to refer to the Bible. Reformed Baptists as a whole use various translations, the ESV being quite common, but others like the Christian Standard Bible or Legacy Standard Bible are also used. There is a minority group which prefers translations produced from the Textus Receptus Greek. In the 2022 book, Why I Preach from the Received Text, an anthology of essays by Reformed ministers, each chapter was written by a different minister and several of the contributors were Reformed Baptists. Most of those who contributed used the King James Version in their church. On creation, the confession says that God created the world and all things therein in six days. After making all other creatures, he made man, male, and female. There is a nearly universal rejection of evolution among 1689 Reformed Baptists. For example, Covenant Baptist Church in Clarksville, Tennessee says, God created all things from nothing. Adam and Eve were the first humans. They were created by God after his own image in perfect righteousness. The account of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 is historical, not mystical. Hence, evolution is a theory contrary to a scriptural understanding of creation. Most Reformed Baptists who have an explicit teaching on the age of the earth teach young earth creation. For example, the Young Earth Creation Organization Answers in Genesis is linked to by the websites of Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Mebane, North Carolina, Albany Baptist Church in New York, the Fellowship of Reformed Baptist Churches in New Zealand and is even supported financially by Trinity Reformed Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas. However, a young earth is not generally taught as the sole acceptable position and there are those who hold to old earth creation. Charles Spurgeon, who said of the 1689 Confession that it is the most excellent epitome of the things most surely believed among us, also said that the earth was created many millions of years before the time of Adam. On original sin, the confession says, our first parents by this sin fell from their original 
righteousness and communion with God, and we in them, whereby death came upon all, all becoming dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. They being the root, and by God's appointment, standing in the room instead of all mankind, the guilt of the sin was imputed, and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity descending from them by ordinary generation, being now conceived in sin, and by nature children of wrath, the servants of sin, the subjects of death, and all other miseries, spiritual, temporal, and eternal, unless the Lord Jesus set them free. Trinity Baptist Church in Burlington, Ontario, Canada says, What are we to do to be saved? We must turn to God in Christ, which entails turning back from sin. If we repent of, decide to forsake and turn from, our sin, as best as we understand it, and trust in Christ as a living person, we will be saved from God's righteous wrath against our sins. Grace Chapel Reformed Baptist Church in Argo, Alabama says, God regenerates us in order to make us willing followers of Christ and not vice versa. Grace will always be resisted until God chooses to cause us to be born again, after which we joyfully comply with grace. In other words, regeneration precedes faith. The grace of regeneration does not require our acceptance, but rather creates it. Jim Sevastio, pastor of Reformed Baptist Church of Louisville, writes, Reformed Baptist churches are distinguished by the conviction that salvation radically alters the life of the convert. It is tragic that such a thing needs to be mentioned. We live in a day of decisionism. The idea that you pray a certain formula prayer and are therefore declared to be saved. It matters not whether you break with sin or pursue holiness. You can live like hell and go to heaven. What a bargain. Many popular Bible teachers claim this as a great defense of the grace of God. We see it clearly as a turning of the grace of God into licentiousness. When Paul describes the conversion of the Ephesians in chapter 5, he uses the greatest antonyms in the human language. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And in 2 Corinthians 6.14, Paul asks the rhetorical question, What fellowship has light with darkness? The Jesus we proclaim is a great Savior. He does not leave his people in their lifeless condition. We proclaim the Jesus who came to save his people from their sins. We proclaim the biblical truth that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. We proclaim the Jesus who came to make a people zealous for good works. We reject as unbiblical the modern notion that a man can embrace Christ as Savior and reject his Lordship. The Word of God nowhere teaches that Christ can be divided. If you have Christ at all, you have received a whole Christ, prophet, priest, and king. Chapter 3 of the Confession says, God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things, whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby is God neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established, in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things, and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. It also clarifies that God doesn't decree something because he foresaw it in the future, and that some people are predestinated to eternal life while others are left to act in their sin to their just condemnation. The number of elect is definite and cannot be increased or diminished. God's determinate counsel extends to the fall and sinful actions of men, but the sinfulness proceeds only from them and not God who is not the author of sin. Reformed Baptist churches affirm the doctrines of grace, sometimes also called the five points of Calvinism. Providence Reformed Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota describes them as follows. Total depravity. Man, as born into the world, is full of sin and thus unable to do anything good in his own power, including believe in Christ. He needs God to save him. Unconditional election. God has chosen from all eternity those whom he would save, not because he foresaw that they would believe, nor because of any good he foresaw in them, but out of his mere love and good pleasure. Limited atonement. Christ died for those chosen and given to him by his Father. He came to seek and save what was lost, and he fully accomplished his mission. Irresistible grace. The Holy Spirit sovereignly brings to faith all whom the Father has chosen and Christ has redeemed and is never frustrated by their willful rebellion. Perseverance of the saints. God not only chooses those who will be saved and brings them to repentance and faith, but he also causes them to persevere in the faith until the end of their earthly life. Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Dalton, Georgia uses the terms radical corruption, unconditional election, definite atonement, 
effectual calling and perseverance of the saints. Some Reformed Baptists dislike the term Calvinist, like Christ Bible Church in Kingsport, Tennessee, which says, we affirm the doctrines of grace, which are typically and tragically referred to as Calvinism. Against popular belief, we do not adhere to the teachings of John Calvin, but through an unwavering commitment to the scripture, we submit to these teachings because they are present within the word of God. However, many Reformed Baptist churches embrace the term, like Triune Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Denton, Maryland, which says, we are a Reformed Baptist Church, therefore we are Calvinist, Covenantal, and Confessional. On evangelism, the late pastor William Payne of Trinity Baptist Church in Burlington, Ontario, Canada wrote, We do not believe that there is an inconsistency between God's sovereignty in the salvation of his chosen people and his command to us to preach the gospel to every creature. If there seems to be a difficulty in our minds reconciling any of the truths of his word, we see it as the result of the darkness of our own understanding. And we believe that our duty is to obey the word whether we understand it at all or not. We believe in evangelism. Now, it is true that we do not believe in much that goes under the name of evangelism in this 20th century. We believe that many that is called evangelism today is little more than psychology and salesmanship. We are appalled by the superficial work which goes under the name of evangelism. We are appalled by the pressures, gimmicks, and schemes, all calculated to produce decisions and impressive statistics, but which work havoc in the souls of men. No, the message of evangelism must be according to the scriptures, and the method of evangelism must be governed by the word of God. Chapter 6 of the Confession says, The corruption of nature during this life does remain in those that are regenerated, and although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and the first motions thereof are truly and properly sin. Reformed Baptists therefore reject the teaching of entire sanctification or Christian perfection. Most Reformed Baptist churches are cessationist. In chapter 1 of the Confession it says, Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diversified manners to reveal himself and to declare his will unto his church, and afterward for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same holy unto writing, which makes the Holy Scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people being now completed. Peninsula Bible Church in Port Angeles, Washington says we are non-Pentecostal. While we recognize every believer has been given spiritual gifts, we believe that revelatory spiritual gifts such as tongues and prophecy were foundational for the early church and are no longer given today. An important aspect of Reformed Baptist theology is that of covenant. The confession says in part, Moreover, man having brought himself under the curse of the law by his fall, it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace, wherein he freely offers unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they might be saved. This covenant is revealed in the gospel, first of all to Adam in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman, and afterwards by farther steps until the full discovery thereof was completed in the New Testament, and is founded in that eternal covenant transaction that was between the Father and the Son about the redemption of the elect. And it is alone by the grace of this covenant that all the posterity of fallen Adam that ever were saved did obtain life and blessed immortality, man being now utterly incapable of acceptance with God upon those terms on which Adam stood in his state of innocency. Many of those who are Reformed Baptists and subscribe to the 1689 Confession hold to a covenant theology biblical interpretation framework today called 1689 Federalism. This viewpoint can be contrasted against Presbyterian Reform theology, but also against Dispensationalism. Justin Perdue, pastor of Covenant Baptist Church in Arden, North Carolina, writes of 1689 Federalism, Let me give a 30,000-foot overview of 1689 Federalism. In eternity past, the triune God established the covenant of redemption. The Son would be the covenant head of an elect people, whom he would secure by becoming a man to represent men, keeping the Mosaic law, moral, ceremonial, and civil, satisfying the law's penalty on the cross, rising to conquer sin and the curse, and drawing those people by his spirit to live with him forever in a new heaven and a new earth. God then made a covenant of works with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Adam, also a covenant head, could earn blessedness and life for himself and his posterity, or he could earn death through disobedience. He earned the latter. God therefore made a covenant with Noah, which promised to sustain creation and its cultural activities, including procreation, 
and to provide a mechanism for securing retributive justice so that God the Son could accomplish salvation. To that end, God established a covenant of grace by which Jesus would freely grant salvation to all who receive him by faith. The covenant was promised in Genesis 3.15. It was explained and revealed in and through the covenants with Abraham, Israel, and David. And it was established and accomplished through Christ and the new covenant. These three covenants with Abraham, Israel, and David together comprise what the Bible calls the Old Covenant, as in Old Covenant equals Abrahamic Covenant plus Mosaic Covenant plus Davidic Covenant. On the website 1689federalism.com, the question is asked, is 1689 federalism dispensational? And the answer given is no, it is actually anti-dispensational. Charles Ryrie identified three essential tenets of dispensationalism. Number one, keeping Israel and the church distinct throughout eternity. Number two, a hermeneutic of literal interpretation. Number one is derived from number two. Number three, salvation is not the main underlying purpose of God's work in history. 1689 federalism rejects all three. 1689 Federalism is not, however, held to by all Reformed Baptists, not even to all who hold to the 1689 Confession. Fitting into the covenantal interpretation of Scripture are the most common Reformed Baptist views on eschatology. Amillennialism is extremely common, and Preterist Postmillennialism also has adherents. Charles Spurgeon is an example of a Reformed Baptist who is historic premillennial in his eschatology. However, some churches that go by the name of Reformed Baptist are dispensational and premillennial. Note that many Reformed Baptists say being covenantal is essential to being a true Reformed Baptist, and these dispensationalists are frequently viewed by the rest as not being true Reformed Baptists. Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio says, We do not claim that the 1689 is an exhaustive presentation of our teaching. We teach that the church started on the day of Pentecost. We also teach that the church is distinct from Israel and that God's Old Testament promises to the nation of Israel will be fulfilled in a literal earthly millennium before he ushers in the eternal state. We acknowledge that the 1689 does not explicitly affirm these doctrines. We understand that some would question whether it is consistent for us to hold to the 1689 with those views. We believe that it is consistent for us to hold to a dispensational, carefully defined, premillennial position on eschatology in the broader framework of the 1689 Confession. This position is even more common among Reformed Baptists who don't hold to the 1689 Confession. Among the adherents of postmillennial eschatology, some Reformed Baptists also hold to the theological position called theonomy. This position is not held by most Reformed Baptists, however, and some like Sam Waldron have written critiques of it. One statement of what theonomy means is that all just civil law derives from God's law. The moral law of God, which is creational or natural, universal and immutable, grounds all true law for human society. Another definition is the biblical teaching that Mosaic law contains perpetual moral standards for living, including some civil laws which remain obligatory for today. In part, on marriage, the confession says, Marriage is to be between one man and one woman. Neither is it lawful for any man to have more than one wife, nor for any woman to have more than one husband at the same time. 1689 Reformed Baptists hold to conservative views on human sexuality. Temple Baptist Church in Haw River, North Carolina says, Sexual relations between one man and one woman in the exclusive covenant of marriage are morally right, are the gift of God, and are affirmed by this church. All other forms of sexuality, as well as the inordinate desires and lusts therein, homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, bestiality, incest, fornication, adultery, transgenderism, and any other sexual activity forbidden by the Bible, are regarded as moral evils. Homosexuality is also unnatural. One's genetic and biological gender is not to be altered nor obscured by dress, appearance, or medical means. The person committing such sins should repent, forsake them, and seek the grace, pardon, and liberation offered to sinners in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The practice of such sinful forms of sexuality is inconsistent with membership in this church, and those who engage in such practices will not be received into membership. This is consistent with Reformed Baptist views. Reformed Baptist churches teach that there are biblical and unbiblical reasons for divorce. For example, Spirit of Life Reformed Baptist Church in Bristol, England says that only New Testament grounds for divorce are sexual sin or desertion by an unbeliever. And also, we teach that remarriage is permitted to a faithful partner, but only when the divorce was on biblical grounds. They also say that a person divorced before conversion may be remarried. Texarkana Reformed Baptist Church in Arkansas similarly says, 
We believe that God disapproves of divorce and intends marriage to last until one of the spouses dies. The Lord, however, has allowed exceptions to this rule in cases of, number one, sexual immorality, and number two, desertion of a believer by his unbelieving spouse. Remarriage is granted by the scriptures in both cases. These are common Reformed Baptist views on remarriage, but there can be some differences. Opposition to abortion is normally strongly held to by 1689 Reformed Baptist churches. Pastor Scott Brown of Hope Baptist Church in Wake Forest, North Carolina says, Mankind has been commanded to be fruitful and multiply, but we have worked to achieve zero population growth. As a result, we are experiencing a global loathing of childbearing so comprehensively that most of the nations of the world are far below population sustainability, plunging them into economic difficulty. Difficulty. In America alone, we have wiped out 30% of the babies conceived since the passage of Roe v. Wade in 1973. This has been the final solution for over 40 million babies in America alone. It shows how desperately we reject the principle of man made in the image of God and the commandment, do not murder. On worship, some Reformed Baptist churches are family integrated, meaning that the church emphasizes having families learn and worship together instead of going to separate classes or Sunday schools. There is a family integrated church network that has a directory at churchandfamilylife.com, and this network was founded by Reformed Baptist Church pastor Scott T. Brown, who is the current director. A good portion of churches on the map are Reformed Baptist. Reformed Baptists hold to the regulative principle of worship. Dr. Robert Gonzalez, Dean of Reformed Baptist Seminary, says, The Bible doesn't just tell us what to avoid in the worship of God, it also tells us what kind of worship is pleasing to God. Biblical directives define for us what is essential for true worship. When it comes to corporate worship, these essentials are called elements, and they include preaching and teaching God's Word, reading Scripture, offering corporate prayer, singing congregational praise, observing baptism and the Lord's Supper, engaging in Christian community, proclaiming the gospel to the lost, and giving financially to support the ministry of the church. The elements above are intrinsic to New Covenant worship. Accordingly, the church is obligated to incorporate those elements in her worship that God's word requires, whether through direct command, binding precedent, biblical principle, or necessary inference. Conversely, the church may not introduce any new elements into her worship that do not have positive warrant from God's word. Gonzalez then quotes the confession in saying, God may not be worshipped in any other way that is not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. He goes on to say, While God has told us what to do, he has not in every case given us detailed instructions regarding precisely how to do it in our specific historical and cultural setting. In principle, churches have the freedom to employ circumstantial aids in worship, such as pulpits, pews, hymn books, musical instruments, audio slash visual technologies, etc. But that freedom is not unbounded. It must be appropriate to the congregation's historical and cultural place of ministry. Worship style can vary among these churches. For example, Sovereign Grace Fellowship in Nampa, Idaho says, What is your worship music like? Our worship is a reverent blending of psalms, older hymns, and contemporary hymns and praise songs. We intentionally seek to be broad in our makeup out of a conviction that the church has been blessed with worthy worship music throughout the ages, and it is unhealthy to gravitate to an exclusive approach that neglects the rich vastness afforded us. Do you clap or lift up hands during your worship? Clapping, lifting up hands, and other physical expressions are encouraged when appropriate to the tone and content of the respective song. For example, clapping to a song like Amazing Grace would probably not make much sense. You will find varied responses from people during worship. We don't seek to conjure up emotions, nor do we discourage genuine, heartfelt, physical expressions during worship. Most Reformed Baptist churches emphasize the importance of expository or expositional preaching. Sunday is the day of worship, and most Reformed Baptists consider it to be the Christian Sabbath. Most Reformed Baptist churches do not teach that consuming alcohol is sinful. Grace Baptist Church in Stockport, England says that alcohol is a good gift from God, but that it should be used sparingly. They say Christians who take the Bible seriously will never get drunk, and some Christians should not drink at all, listing as examples people who have been addicted to alcohol, those who have addictive or obsessive tendencies, and those who are exposed to temptation because of their circumstances. For example, the church counsels students to have a policy of complete abstinence. Dr. Robert Gonzalez, Dean of Reformed Baptist Seminary, wrote, Jesus drank wine that had enough alcoholic content to intoxicate a person if used in excess. We know Jesus was sinless, therefore he never drank in excess and was never guilty of drunkenness. Jesus used alcohol in moderation, and he sometimes drank in public. So the unavoidable answer to the question with which we began this study is, yes, Jesus was a social drinker.
Reformed Baptists often affirm the principle of tithing 10% of one's income to the church. Reformed Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas says, Since tithing is clearly taught as a requirement of the scriptures, both as a duly appointed means of worship and to provide financial support for the work of the Lord through the local church, and since failure to give the tithe is therefore involvement in sin before God, all members are to consistently, systematically, and conscientiously bring the full tithe, 10% of one's income, into the storehouse. Christ Baptist Church in Kingsport, Tennessee says, Do I have to tithe? We would hope that all church members would joyfully give in accordance with Scripture and in support of what God is doing here at Christ Bible Church, but in no way do we demand anyone to give against their will. Many Reformed Baptist churches have a strong emphasis on family. For example, Reformed Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas says, Members of this church are to obey the teachings of the scriptures in respect to family life and government. As the God-appointed head of the family, the husband must rule over the household with gentleness and love, but also with wisdom and firmness. The wife must be in submission to her husband in all things according to the rule of scripture. The husband with the wife must nurture their children in the chastening and admonition of the Lord by setting a godly example before them and by wise and firm discipline, including the immediate application of corporal punishment as soon as the occasion warrants it. Each family unit of this church is encouraged to conduct worship in the home. Family worship has been characteristic of God's people down through the ages. Abraham, Joshua, David, Timothy. The lack of family worship makes the home subject to the wrath of God. But the observance of such worship ensures his blessings, such as the prevention of much sin in the home and the special presence of Christ Jesus with the family while they worship. Church polity in nearly all 1689 Reformed Baptist churches is congregational. That is, there is no earthly authority above the local church like a presbytery or synod. Some Reformed Baptist churches are part of fellowships, networks, or denominations, but in these cases the associations are nearly always voluntary and non-binding. Internal church government is most often a plurality of elders or pastors, though some congregations have only one pastor. Legacy Reformed Baptist Church in East Grand Forks, Minnesota says, We believe in the autonomy of the local church as well as a form of congregational church governance. While we may partner with other like-minded churches or even join a network or association of churches, each church is independent and answerable to scripture and to God. There is no hierarchy or organized structure of leadership or authority outside of the local church. We have an elder ruled with congregational consent form of government, which means that God has placed certain responsibility for leadership upon the elders of the church and the congregation possesses authority in all other areas, as well as in providing accountability for the elders. On offices of the church, the confession says, a particular church gathered and completely organized according to the mind of Christ consists of officers and members, and the officers appointed by Christ to be chosen and set apart by the church, so called and gathered, for the peculiar administration of ordinances and execution of power or duty, which he entrusts them with or calls them to, to be continued to the end of the world, are bishops or elders and deacons. The confession treats bishop and elder as synonymous, and most Reformed Baptist churches will use the title of elder or pastor for this office. Some Reformed Baptists have both elders and pastors as separate roles. 1689 Reformed Baptists have only men as pastors and elders. Reformed Baptist Church in Kalamazoo, Michigan's statement on this issue is representative of the belief of most Reformed Baptist churches. They say, we believe that church leadership is designed by God to be male leadership as taught and modeled by Jesus and his apostles. Men and women are both made in the image of God. Men and women are equal in personhood, dignity, and value, but are distinct in their God-given roles. We believe that the male leadership of the family is also meant to be exercised in the church. Therefore, we only have biblically qualified men serving as pastors, elders, and deacons. A small minority of Reformed Baptists do have deaconesses. Reformed Baptist churches may or may not be part of networks or associations. The Confessional Baptist Association requires full subscription to the 1689 Confession and has 13 churches. Fire Fellowship says, We stand in the tradition of the historic Reformed Confessions of Faith, such as the London Baptist Confession of 1644 and the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. There are 102 churches, most of which are 1689 Reformed Baptists. Founders Ministries says, We recognize the time-tested Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689, as a faithful summary of important biblical teachings. They have a directory of over 1,000 churches, many of which are also part of the Southern Baptist Convention, which Founders Ministries formed within. The Reformed Baptist Network says, We believe in a robust confessionalism, a strong adherence to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. They have 46 U.S. churches in their directory. The G3 Church Network 
Network says of member churches, the pastors of the church must, at a minimum, affirm the 1689, even if the church's statement of faith is not officially the 1689. They have 188 churches on their map. Sovereign Grace Fellowship of Canada says, We accept two Baptist confessions, known as the First London Confession of 1644 and the Second London Confession of 1689. We receive into membership churches that hold to either confession. They have 15 member churches. Grace Reformed Network, chartered in 2023, has nine churches in their directory. Churches may be part of multiple of these networks. There are also regional associations and fellowships like the Southeastern Association of Confessional Baptists and Southern California Association of Reformed Baptist Churches. Beyond this, Reformed Baptist congregations may be part of broader networks or directories like the Gospel Coalition's Church Finder or that of Nine Marks. 1689.com lists five seminaries in the U.S., Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary in Kentucky, Grace Bible Theological Seminary in Arkansas, International Reform Baptist Seminary in Texas, and Institute of Public Theology, and Reform Baptist Seminary, both in Florida. As for total number of Reform Baptist churches in the U.S., there are some online directories that may give an idea, though they are normally containing some Reform Baptist churches that don't affirm the 1689 Confession. The directory on reformedwiki.com shows 936 churches in the United States. 1689.com has 730 U.S. churches on their map and 44 in Canada. Farise.com has a map described as a collection of 582 churches that hold to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith or a similar statement of faith. A transcript with footnotes for everything referenced in this video is available for members at readytoharvest.com. For more videos on Baptist groups, watch the Baptist playlist here on the Ready to Harvest channel.